Good morning, everybody. We are so pleased to just be finishing up with the Parker Lecture, and we would invite you to sit down. We're going to have a discussion. I know we have a wonderful live stream audience this morning, and we are really pleased to be able to start this conversation. Um, for folks who have been watching all morning, you know that we've had the um, 32nd annual Parker Lecture uh, with Ch FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler, uh, honoring Kathy Sandoval and Maki Makani Temba. But we are definitely asking people in the room to call your attention to this next discussion. And if you want to continue talking, we would welcome that in the outside so that we can all hear each other. Um, this is a great conversation, and we had a really inspirational words this morning about the interplay between access and content and the importance of media in our society and its role. And we are very excited to sort of continue that conversation. So we're going to have a panel uh, right now uh, with myself. My name is Cheryl Lianza. I am the policy advisor to the United Church of Christ, OC Inc., uh, which is the media justice ministry of the United Church of Christ. And we're about to have this discussion uh, about religion and the media. So the panel, we're going to look at the interplay between religion and the media. And I always think of religion as sort of one of the earth, the, the, the most clear set of communicators, right? Religion quite often is about communication. And obviously we know media going back as early as the printed word and or even in oral discussion have such an important influence on, on the world. And so clearly the interplay of these two institutions has been important from the beginning of both of their creation to today. And what we're looking at this morning is more modern times. How has that changed in recent, in recent times? How has media and religion changed? Uh, what's the impact outwardly on civic society? And what's the impact inwardly? What's the impact on religious institutions and religious people themselves when they see that media? Uh, and how, how does it affect them? So to consider these points, we have several distinguished guests with a really um, nice range of, of viewpoints and vantage points. So uh, first we have in the center is uh, Robert Jones, the CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute. Uh, on my right, we have Reverend J. Bennett Guess, who is the Executive Minister of Local Church Ministries of the United Church of Christ. And on the end, we have Jean Polisinski, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Museum Institute. And so we're just going to get started. We're going to let each of our panelists kind of give us a little, a few minutes uh, of overview or their initial thoughts on the topic. And then we'll have conversation. And since those of you in the room, um, we're a small group. So please, let's have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. You're welcome to come up front if you want to ask questions. I know we have a lot of folks who are real experts in themselves uh, in the room. So um, please don't be shy. I'll be happy to share the microphone or come on down and, and uh, talk with you about it. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Jones. I'm up? up. Great. All right. Uh, well, uh, let me start first with just a little personal anecdote. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I am from Jackson, Mississippi. So I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi uh, and uh, came of age in the 70s. And so uh, I owe a debt to uh, Everett Parker and the UCC. Uh, WLBT would have been a very different station that I would have grown up watching uh, had it not been for uh, the work there. So uh, I want to say thank you to the UCC and to Everett Parker and his legacy uh, as well. So um, having said that, um, I, I'm going to just talk just a few minutes about the challenges of covering religion uh, in America today um, from the standpoint of how much it's changing. Right? And so I, I thought it might be helpful to kind of harken back to the 1950s. There was this, this um, uh, a book in sociology by, by Will Herberg. Uh, where he wrote kind of describing the American religious landscapes. Anybody know this book? The, the, the title of it was Protestant Catholic Jew. Right? Uh, that's how he'd sort of describe the basic American religious landscape in the 1950s. Right? And so, and this was, you know, fairly accurate. It certainly didn't capture all of the religious differences and vibrancy that was going on, but it was, I think, a, a defensible uh, way of talking about the American religious landscape. You could not title a book that way today, right? No. Uh, you would be in uh, a lot of trouble. I mean, it wouldn't even get out of the gate. Uh, and so I think it's, it's sort of interesting to think about that. And so just a couple of um, things here. So about 5% of the population today, in, of the American population today, is outside of that triad, right? And, and that's a growing proportion of the population, about 5%. The other uh, part that makes this, um, I think, much uh, different is the growing number of Americans who are not religiously affiliated has changed dramatically, just since even the 1990s. Uh, so as late as the 1990s, we were down in single digits um, like 6% of the American public claim no religious affiliation at all. That number is 21% today, right? So what that means is that a quarter of Americans fall outside of that Protestant Catholic Jew uh, triad that was sort of encompassing of, of much of the 
um, uh, American religious landscape in the 1950s. And then just one other thing, even if we look under that, uh, if we look at Protestants, right, the world of what, what was encompassed by Protestant when Will Herberg wrote this book is quite different than it is today. So uh, 2013 into 2014 marks the first time, for example, that America is a minority Protestant country, right? We're 48% Protestant. That's something new uh, in the American uh, religious landscape. If we look at uh, and, and also, the story into, into the 80s, right, was uh, the, the, the uh, or in the 50s, it was mainline Protestants, uh, and it was the UCC, and it was the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians. Into the 80s and 90s, the story became about evangelicals, right, and the rise of the moral majority and the Christian coalition. Uh, and then today, uh, we're even in a new phase where even that wave has crested, I think, and is, is falling off. And I think religion reporters are scrambling to, what is the story, right, if that's not the story uh, that we've had. Uh, if we look at Catholic, um, Catholics uh, today are, um, have, have maintained the proportion of the population be only because of Latino immigration in the country. The number of white Catholics uh, has diminished um, dramatically over the past 20 years. In fact, 12% of Americans are former Catholics. Right, uh, and so, and that's mostly because of white attrition, and then replacement by uh, Latino immigrants, mostly from Mexico. And in the West today, um, ca uh, Catholics are majority Hispanic uh, in the West today. So that's also a very different uh, thing. And then finally, um, the the um, the proportion of Jews hasn't changed that much. Uh, to take the kind of third piece of the triad, uh, but the place of Jews in American society has changed quite dramatically. Right, if you think about the uh, the founding, for example, of Brandeis. Uh, right, uh, uh, which was because of quotas at the Ivy League systems uh, that, that prevented many Jews from enrolling. Uh, and, and we look at public opinion today, actually Jews score quite high on uh, social acceptability or, or warm feelings of ethnic groups. They score quite high and have been much more mainstreamed in, in society today. So just to kind of take those three triads as a kind of little trope of understanding how things have changed, um, it, it's, it's a quite dramatic thing and a big challenge, I think, for the coverage of religion uh, today because it's a much more diverse landscape than we've ever seen. Thanks so much, Dr. Jones. Uh, Reverend Guess, how do you t start to approach this issue? Uh, well, my life has actually been a uh, conversation between religion and journalism. Um, after graduating from University of Kentucky's School of Journalism and working for a couple of uh, daily newspapers in Kentucky, uh, I thought I was leaving my journalism world behind and I was going into ministry. And so I went to seminary, served 12 years in a local church, and then found myself for another dozen years in the interplay of that conversation, reporting the news within a national church organization on behalf of the United Church of Christ, and also interpreting the news stories uh, on behalf of the UCC uh, to, to other media. I think when we entered this conversation about religion and the news media, it depends uh, which hat you're wearing, uh, how you enter into that conversation. Most people who would think that we're having this conversation here uh, this morning, if you're from looking at it through the lens of a, a faith perspective, you would say, well, I'm glad you're having that conversation because I, that's something I've been wanting to touch on. I wish you would talk about how they mischaracterize us and paint all of us with the same broad brush. Uh, how our viewpoint as religious people is not heard and articulated within the media, how our stories are not there, how news media reports only on the bad things that we do, and churches and synagogues and mosques do so many good things, and so we're not reporting on that. If you are wearing that hat, that's the kind of conversation that you want to have. If you are wearing the journalist hat, you say, well, I'm glad we're having this conversation about religion and the media because it's an important conversation that we need to be having because I'm really concerned about the lack of transparency that exists within religious organizations and why are they uh, making decisions behind closed doors and why are they not uh, as have the sort of sunshine laws that we expect of government that these large religious bodies are not uh, more responsive. Uh, how come religious organizations are afraid of the media and uh, th that, that they don't, they misunderstand the media and we need to have the conversation about how we work together around truth finding. So it's a conversation that really has both lens and I think uh, in, in many ways uh, within our newsrooms there is uh, evolution both in newsrooms and in churches um, and that, that evolution has, really means that in order to improve religion and media conversations, it really uh, requires 
both of us, both parties, uh, to recognize uh, our weaknesses and places where we need to grow in that relationship. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jean, how about you? What's your first thoughts as we in start on this, this dialogue? Well, I think our colleagues here have, have very well framed the, the sort of atmospherics that we're talking about. Um, I'd just like to note, by the way, in terms of the Parker lecture, uh, we talked throughout that portion of the today's program a great deal about the history and the legacy and the meaning. But you know, it lives today. If you look at the petition that Commissioner Wheeler has agreed to hear, the Chairman Wheeler has agreed to hear, regarding the Washington team, the NFL team's nickname, the very first case cited, and actually the entree for that petition to be heard by the commission, was in fact the lawsuit brought by Reverend Parker that established that right of citizens, of viewers, of interested parties to approach the FCC with a complaint about everything ranging from uh, indecency to bigotry to racism and misuse of the licenses. So, uh, you know, that decision fans out across a great variety of issues and, and across the ages to be as contemporary as just a few days ago in that petition that was brought by a Washington law professor. When we talk about religion in the media, I think it's also when we paint that very good landscape about the increased diversity and the challenges and about the two sides. I love that phrasing about the two ways to look at this. We also have to talk about a changing media landscape. Uh, we're talking about institutions which, uh, for better or worse, were very often in the 1980s, as late as the 1980s, early 1990s, anchored in traditions of coverage and in focuses uh, and in lack of coverage that really had existed for decades. Uh, the iconoclastic uh, journalist of the movies the hard-drinking, uh, unchurched largely, or irreverent, uh, shall we call it, uh, imagery, uh, perhaps wasn't all that far from the truth. In many ways, um, those editors made decisions based on their own interests or the interests of their owners. Um, there were very defined areas of coverage and the religion coverage in most newspapers beyond a few large institutions was institutional. Uh, time of services, uh, a new pastor, a new, uh, a development, perhaps uh, advertising a local fish fry. Uh, you know, it was really at that sort of granular change and institutional level. Uh, we commissioned a, as a foundation, uh, and the foundation that is behind supports and is the principal funder of the museum and the Museum Institute is called the Freedom Forum. Uh, it's a, a came after something called the Gannett Foundation, Frank, started by Frank Gannett. No real connection to the company Gannett, but uh, other than that, they were both. He founded both. Uh, we commissioned a study by John Dart and the Reverend Jimmy Allen um, to look at this disparity between coverage and impressions and, and the nature of coverage called Bridging the Gap, and then we re replicated that study 10 years later. Unfortunately, what we charted as one of the findings in that study, uh, other than finding that, by the way, there was many more uh, journalists who identified themselves as religious than I think might have been thought at the time, but we charted the bell curve of the rise and fall of the specific beat to cover religion and the specific reporter with an expertise in covering people of faith uh, and with experience and training and sometimes even a divinity degree at its peak, um, where uh, there became much more of the kind of content coverage that I suspect people of faith wish there was more of in the media. And as we saw the economic fortunes of these media giants and uh, all the way down to family-owned newspapers changed dramatically uh, actually before the internet in some systemic changes in terms of the way people consumed news and they began to uh, look at uh, more of the free delivery of news and access to news in different ways. Those specialty positions came, developed, flowered, and then began to diminish. And today I suspect they've gone the way of environmental writers, of a number of other kinds of specialists, transportation writers, uh, at most news operations uh, that are the traditional media. And I think in the online media, one of the distressing things I'm finding is that we don't see the growth where it might be easier, frankly, or re, you know, more accessible for people. We don't seeing that, that bell curve come back up again with the hiring. And I, I think if I had a wish for today's media, I would say as the audience becomes so fundamentally different. For the very first time in, the, in our country's history, probably the history of media, you have the consumer being the decision maker, pulling the news and information out from sources that they want. It's not a gatekeeper function any longer for editors to, to just say, well, here's the eight things I think are news. You know, they really have to be much more responsive. Uh, 
my very first editor told me there were only two real interests, well, three if you count taxes, uh, among our readers. But he said the real two interests on a personal level were education and faith. And he said, if you look at our, our in those days, the readers of a newspaper I worked for, he said, those are the two interests. And I think we have done um, a disservice, really, by allowing that curve to come back down and ignore one of the principal areas where I think there is great room and great opportunity to really touch on something that is such a, even with the growth of the unchurched, um, that's still a great majority of Americans who identify with the faith or, or see themselves as people of faith. And I think much of the media landscape is not fully utilizing that kind of opportunity to, to really reach out to, with a topic that people are vitally interested in beyond the fish fry ads and the opportunities to just note the institution. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is a really, this is a really great conversation and also I wanna be sure as I start to ask questions, like I said, if anybody else has questions or things they wanna share or if you guys have questions to ask each other, um, we're open to that. We're uh, going to be a, a really interactive, uh, hopefully organic conversation. Um, but I will kick off the conversation. I think one of the things that was on my mind is um, in some of Dr. Jones' research at the uh, Public Religion Research Institute, you know, Pew numbers. One of the things we see is that familiarity with an individual who is of a particular religious background leads to individuals sort of have a different perspective on you know, people of that background. So if you know somebody who's Jewish, you might be more able to see beyond a stereotype. You know, do you trust this person to be in public office or do you, you know, attribute a negative feeling or a positive feeling to them because of that attribute as opposed to a because of, of who they are specifically. Um, and so we know that in this country, you know, we have this important growing role of uh, Muslim Americans, uh, Americans of, of, of some of a variety of backgrounds, Buddhists. Um, and as Dr. Jones mentioned, you know, we also have Jewish people in this country um, who are, are viewed very favorably, and unfortunately, Muslim people who are viewed not so favorably when you when the, the temperature is taken of how people are, are viewing uh, uh, folks with various religious backgrounds. So I wonder if we could just explore that a little bit more, kind of get behind that a little bit in terms of, you know, often we see the media as the way that you learn about a person or an individual or a group if you don't have that direct experience in your own life. So if you don't have it in your own life, then, um, you know, the, your best way, you know, it's likely that you're going to draw some conclusions by what you read in the media and see in the media because you don't have personal experience to contrast it with. Um, I don't know if, if um, Dr. Jones, you want to start with sort of talking about some of that, you know, some of that statistical analysis that shows that uh, to lay that out a little bit more. Sure. I, I mean, I, I want to just p sort of pick up here on, on these comments. I, I do think that um, I, I just came from the Religion News Writers Conference a few right. weeks ago, uh, which is uh, a conference of you know two or three hundred of the people who are left, uh, you know, writing uh, dedicated writing to religion, have an expertise in the area, and even there among conversations, you know, what I heard was. Well, now I'm covering Metro, and I'm covering, you know, uh, and so and it's just become one part of uh, what they're covering, and the time they have allotted is actually quite small, even uh, at some more local outlets, and even in places like the South, where religion is still very vibrant and very, uh, you know, every, part of everyday, everyday experience. Um, but one thing I'll say about the diversity, and kind of uh, pivot over to, to Cheryl's question, one challenge, I think, with particularly um, some of the, the newer religious diversity, while um, we are seeing uh, religious diversity show up, for example, in the Midwest or even in the South. Uh, so when I go back to visit my parents to bring it back to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in this little suburb of Flowood, right outside of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, there is a massive Hindu temple. Um, you know, in Flowood, Mississippi, right outside of Jackson, uh, largely supported by technology workers who have been brought in uh, to the Jackson area. Uh, but that's a kind of thing growing up there I would have, I mean, you know, and, and I have this great photo actually of, uh, it's, it's right next to a pasture, so there's like a horse and a fence and then this massive white Hindu temple right behind it, you know, so a kind of very, uh, uh, a scene you would expect to see in Mississippi and then one you would not see. Um, but having said that, it's still the case that, um, that diversity um, uh, sort of, Americans' everyday experiences of living around Muslims uh, or Sikhs uh, or some of the uh, sort of uh, folks from uh, sort of South Asia uh, is still limited to certain areas of the country and metropolitan areas. Uh, and, and I think that's a real challenge for, uh, last time we asked about this, it was, it was uh, in the single digits of Americans who said they even sometimes 
had an interaction with someone Muslim, right? So it's just not the case for, and so that means that media is playing an outsized role here in shaping what Americans think about uh, these certain uh, groups that they don't have the chance to have um, encounters with. In the case of Islam, I just want to make one, one quick point here, um, because there's so much foreign policy coverage around terrorism, right, that that has really shaped a lot of Americans' uh, views uh, about, about Muslims. And, and one thing that we've, we've seen is that um, particularly television news, right? This sort of runs the 24-hour loop, plays an outsized role here. We had a question on our, um, one of our recent surveys about which television news source do you most trust? And we had Fox News, Broadcast News, CNN, PBS, you know, MSNBC. Um, and interestingly enough, about a, um, a little less than a quarter of Americans uh, say they most trust Fox News. That's about the same number that trust all the broadcast news uh, networks put together, right? So all the broadcast news uh, things have about the same reach in terms of, of trustworthiness uh, as, as Fox News did. And then we looked at the views of Fox News viewers. Uh, if you take their views either on immig immigra immigrants and immigration or views of Muslims, they are uh, 20, 30 points different than the rest of the population in a more negative uh, direction. And even when we look underneath and we control for things like party affiliation, conservative versus liberal, race, education level, even when we control for those things, saying that you most trust Fox News uh, on, the, on the issue of Muslims makes, is an independent predictor of one's, of one's views about Muslims in a negative direction. So it's, it's playing, a, um, so the media consumption, particularly television news, is playing a, a, a pretty strong role in shaping Americans' views of some uh, religious minority groups. And I know the religious, you know, at church level, people often try to reach out between faiths, but I don't know if you have that or, or something uh, in addition to think about uh, this question. Well, there's, um, there's an adage in Minnesota that it doesn't matter whether you're Baptist or Methodist, you're still Lutheran. <laughs> um, and, and that adage could play itself around the country. Yeah. You know, if you're in Georgia, it doesn't matter whether you're Presbyterian or Episcopalian, you're still Baptist. Yeah. If you're in the Northeast, it doesn't matter whether you're UCC or you're Mennonite, you're still Roman Catholic. Um, or you're UCC in, in Utah and you're Mormon. Um, because there is that, that ethos that exists around a certain understanding that is sort of cultural or regional based and then and then in order for you to tell your religious story you're differentiating from what is normative what most people know is roman catholic and, and most conference ministers for example in the ucc will begin by differentiating their role with what a roman catholic bishop does because the assumption is you know what a bishop does so let me tell you how my work is like that and is different from that when you when you take that normative view and try to differentiate from it, and then you take something like Islam, which the normative view is of beheading terrorists uh, causing mayhem around the world, and you are trying to differentiate, you're not ever able to get at that point of differentiation between uh, what is this Muslim sect versus this Muslim sect versus this. It is this normative that is so skewed um, and, and out of balance from anything uh, reality, it makes it a difficult starting place. So within Christianity within our country, we're able to at least have a more civil starting place of differentiation and, and talking about that diversity. Um, I think that's where the, the most important role, and I, I've had conversations, Huffington Post has really invested a lot in uh, religious reporting. Uh, at least three full-time reporters at Huffington Post have a, a full-time religion beat. And, um, and one of the things that they have talked with us about as we've been pitching stories to them from the UCC is we're really interested in the news stories and what you're doing and all of that, but what we're really interested in is the practices of faith and how are people living out their faith in ways that we can tell compelling stories about how faith makes a difference in people's lives and therefore in the culture and the country. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, not only in Christianity, but in, but in Judaism, Islam, all, all the world religions, um, that's the most powerful way that people really understand the sort of personal reason, family reasons why they are who they are. You know, one of the challenges in reporting on religion uh, from a, a, a sort of large media perspective is that uh, the, the really this, and it's interesting, the most trusted statistics, because if you think about how do people develop trust, they really, in a way, uh, and I think a lot of uh, a study would show this, 
It's not necessarily that you convince me. It's when I say, oh, you're, you are agreeing with me, that I, your message is the one I want to hear, that these larger societal determinations of views on religion, uh, when you have media outlets that move from, I think, probably the impossible middle of being totally objective toward either a liberal or conservative or a positive or negative view, you ramp up the trust factor in the people who watch you by really by almost a, an invitation to say, okay, I'm, I'm preaching to you with the words you already want to hear, and therefore I'm trustworthy because, well, you agree with me or I agree with you. So I think what we have is a, a really interesting dilemma on an economic basis now because the media is a very economically challenged industry, is almost in effect this idea that we have greater reward for being in one direction or the other from this potential, potentially perfectly objective uh, standpoint of just bringing you the news because that's where the advertising lies, that's where the economic success or, or sometimes survival lies. And it builds this automatic reinforcement of see how well I'm doing, I'm the most trusted or least trusted. Uh, you know, CBS, I think, is what the most watched, and Fox is the most, you know, there, there's a w different ways of portraying that, but there's almost a disincentive, uh, if I can use a sports analogy. Um, my father played a great deal of tennis, and one of his earliest lessons to me was don't play tennis in the middle of the court. Either play back or play forward, but don't play in the middle. And unfortunately, I think a lot of media organizations today are challenged because they should be in that middle zone uh, in, in a way of being objective, being comprehensive, being thorough. And yet the rewards and the push somewhat from their viewers or listeners or users is to go to the net or go to the back line. So it's a, it's a challenge that bothers me because we have fewer full-time people who can say, well, wait a minute, I, that we did this story last week, we've got to do this story next week. When you're part-time, you just don't have that ability to really balance that kind of coverage. So I'm hoping that we can, through a lot of discussions like this one, encourage our colleagues in the media to say, uh, that middle ground, forget tennis. This is journalism, and you need to be in that middle ground. It's great. You know, one of the questions I had was uh, for you guys to think about was, um, you know, what are the kind of stories or the kind of aspects to stories that you think um, sort of a generalist journalist with so much on uh, his or her plate might miss or might not understand uh, as compared with a journalist that had a greater depth or had a greater amount of time uh, to, to think about it and to reflect and to, uh, to take a long view. Do you have examples or thoughts about sort of how those, how, uh, how it's different now that we have a different set of journalists uh, working on the issue? My goodness, uh, you know, it's, the, it's the, really the range of activities of people of faith. I mean, again, we, we shouldn't pigeonhole these just as to, the, you know, what was in yesterday's sermon or, or lecture or instruction. It's that social engagement. It's that ability of the church to provide services. It's where churches are stepping in. I mean, again, I think as an editor, I'm thinking stepping in now to fill where government is withdrawn. I mean, you could, there's a myriad of stories to do that aren't always uh, about the sort of institutional religion activity but which really represent the activities of people of faith. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I just uh, hunger for those kinds of stories because the more and more I learn about the subject and exposed to the subject in my own life, the more I've realized the range of activities of people of faith. I mean, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, getting beyond religion and below the belt politics, um, you know, that, that religion, you know, religious people and religious organizations are engaged in immigration reform and minimum wage fights uh, and, you know, all kinds of other workplace policy uh, issues, communications, you know, issues, things that you don't think about, I think, and, and if you look at the coverage, it tends to focus around abortion, same-sex marriage, these kind of controversial uh, social issues, but uh, you know, to sort of you know, you know take like North Carolina, the kind of Moral Mondays uh, thing going on in North Carolina, led by a whole coalition of uh, religious groups, that doesn't immediately fit the trope, right, of kind of culture war politics and left versus right. And I think that is somewhere where someone with a little more, you know, it's a little more attuned to the way that kind of religious people actually think that they don't always just talk about abortion and same-sex <laughs> marriage, right? That there is a much broader agenda here. I really identified with that. I, th I think we tend to think of, is this a religious story in the same way we think of it, like we're gonna have a cooking story, we're gonna have a travel story, we're gonna have a religious story, instead of understanding that 
almost within any store, any news story, as there is an economic dimension, as there is a race dimension, that there is a, is a religious dimension. I mean, some people, you know, particularly on the left, want to say, you know, all this marriage, let's take religion out of it. Uh, well, religion plays a role in the marriage equality conversation for those who are both opposed to it and for those who support it. And, and I think the greater challenge for reporters is to move beyond saying, I'm writing a story about subject X and I'm gonna have the secular opinion and then I'm gonna go get somewhere, I'm gonna go get the religious opinion on subject X, but instead uh, to, to, to layer it on as a dimension. I'm gonna cover this from, from a business dimension, from an economic dimension, wh whatever those different layers, lens you are, and that there's a religious dimension within that as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, um, you know, I, I think about sort of the religious perspective on the food story, or you know, something like you said that there's a there's there's all these different topics, and you can layer them on. Uh, a number of years back, UCC's media justice ministry did did some study in Dearborn, Michigan, about the coverage of Arab Americans and Muslims, and of course, one of the things that the research found was that. Uh, Arab Americans were only quoted in stories that had some connection to this international terrorism story, and they were rarely, if they, they were rarely quoted, uh, you know, in a story about education or a story about the local economy. And even if they were, they weren't identified as such, right? You know, so it was a, it was an interesting, it was an interesting set of, of dynamics. And um, I was thinking about, you know, the the importance for uh, the majority and for the Christians to speak out uh, when there are, you know, because there is this tilted uh, coverage and attitude towards Muslim Americans. And um, I wonder if you had any thoughts about sort of what are our obligations um, when, if we're the member of the majority. What are our obligations as we interact with the media or play our roles? Uh, what is it that we should do individually and collectively to help, you know, maybe balance some of that, that coverage? Well, I think every reporter's obligation, every editor's obligation is to, is to get the full story. You know, I think that if we buy into the, the easy, stereotypical kind of coverage <coughs> that has, <coughs> excuse me, at times characterized, I think, the coverage, particularly the, the, the rising recognition of Islam in America. Um, we fail to really do justice to our readers and our users and our viewers that, um, you know, we can't accept that first phone call, uh, the results of that first phone call. I think we need to make that second and third and fourth call. I love the phrase layered coverage because that's really what it is. You know, there was a, a, a debate over a mosque, well, a community center being formed in New York City, as well as one in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where it was a mosque being located. And so much of that coverage was, was a sort of, um, you know, there's this side and there's that side. And I think it failed to get that great middle with a lot of people who simply had questions about what is it and why is it here and what, what's engaged in that and what's the community. There was a wonderful story finally done, I think, in Murfreesboro about the very strong Muslim community that had been there for years and decades which had been not reported on. Yeah. Well, there was a sort of initial failure to report on that community, and then there was a, a secondary failure to really, in those initial stories, talk about the people who were in the fabric of that community's life that weren't really recognized. Um, and so I think, you know, when we talk about the layers of coverage, when we talk about this obligation, I don't look at it as a sort of, you know, 10 pounds of this side and 10 pounds of that side. I think it's just an obligation to get the best accurate, complete and fair story. Let me just give one quick shout out to Bob Smetana at the Tennessean, uh, who covered yes. Yes. the Murfreesboro Mosque controversy and actually won some awards for the Tennessean. Right. You don't think Thank of you the, ten you don't think the Tennessean yeah. as a place that would sort of win some awards for reporting on uh, Muslims uh, in America, but it, Bob Smetana at the Tennessean uh, was someone who really staked that ground out pretty well. Yeah, great. Uh, sure, just one quick thing, if I could tell. Sometimes religion coverage can adv be advanced in a number of ways. My colleague, John Singendaller, who was the editor, longtime editor of the Tennessean, and uh, very active in civil rights and uh, passed away last July. But uh, John hired a religion writer, the first African-American actually writer at the Tennessee. And, um, and as they interviewed, uh, this, and this gentleman was being offered this job, he finally looked at John and said, I know what you're doing. Uh, in addition to getting me to cover religion, every Sunday, Monday morning, you publish a story called A Reporter Goes to Church, which is about a particular sermon. And by sending me to all these churches which have no black members, you're going to integrate those churches at the same way. So I don't know if that's really the role of the media, but you were talking about what could we do. John found a way through a legitimate news hire and really improving his newsroom 
to have another bit of social effect. So sometimes uh, that can happen. So. I've been inviting folks to join the conversation and I see that uh, Reverend Black has the microphone, so I'm assuming uh, you have a question. The, the conversation has just kind of gone in so many different directions and I had many, many thoughts. But I, and I'll, I'll go back to one of the earliest ones when I first looked at the microphone. Just a, a comment and a thought um, uh, that I, I question whether Fox is actually doing news. And, and, and I think that, that your, your analysis of what makes them, uh, what, what makes Fox um, uh, trustworthy kind of fits what I was beginning to think was that the other stations may be, they, they have their biases too, but they may be trying to do more news. I think Fox is really invested in propaganda. And, and I get that, you know, and, and it's because their slant is so very strong and one-sided that it na naturally people who want to hear that, need to hear that slant, trust that. So, you know, so I was just kind of wondering, you know, it, it, am, am I too hard on Fox? To It's kind of like it's news, it's the same story, but the, the twist to me feels more like propaganda than news. Even, even though I would that. agree I, with you, I, I, could, I could take that one, I think. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Even, I, I mean, I'll jump in and say, even though I totally agree with you, Joffrey, somebody could be sitting in the seat next to you and take the mic and make the same characterization about MSNBC. Um, yeah. And I, that's where I really appreciate Gene's analogy, tennis analogy about working the net or working the backcourt, because it's, you know, depending on where you're hitting the ball, you, you, that's, that's your perspective. Um, but... Uh, I do think that's the well, challenge. I mean, yeah. one of the questions that I had in relation to that was, you know, the importance of a civil conversation and to have a shared space of dialogue. I mean, what's interesting is we now in this world of, of new media and so much media, there's so many media outlets. There are many people who could go along perfectly happily in their life and never watch a, a national broadcast program, whereas that prime time broadcasting, although it was very limited in some ways, at least provided some sort of central reference point, as Ben was talking about, well, at least we can all refer to the same central set of stories, and that might be one way to engage with one another, one way to have a dialogue. You know, we have, you know, conservative Christians who may have pulled out of a lot of mainstream media, not necessarily for a negative reason, but because they don't want to be exposed to the commercialism. They don't want their children to be exposed to that. So I've created an entire, you know, media environment. And I was wondering about the opportunity, you know, when we do feel like sometimes some of us who watch Fox will feel like, oh, we, we wouldn't want to watch that. At the same time, what does that do to our ability to have a civil dialogue across? really great uh, chasms of, of difference, but where we need to talk with them other because it's a democracy. Can I, can I, can I go back? Just to say, I, 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 you're, you've helped me because I don't look at uh, MS, I don't look at television very much. That's that's my problem. Okay, so so uh, so MSNBC. I didn't know that they hadn't looked at them that much, but I do. I, and Ben, you know, I, I'm an avid listener to NPR, and and so I, I would like to hear. And, 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 and I hear a lot on NPR that I don't agree with or that, that's fair. So, so where do they fit in your, 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 your assessment of news media being, um, giving us the news? Let, let me try to respond to both of your questions. You know, I think from a First Amendment standpoint, you know, if you look back at the history of the press in America, the, the, the concept of objectivity is really relatively new. There was a commission called the Hutchins Commission after World War II that talked about inclusiveness. I think was a good goal, and that really began this idea of a fair, free, and, and inclusive press. Up until that time, opinion was really prized, and taking a position, and, and identifiable position. A lot of newspapers that still call themselves the something-something Republican or the something-something Democrat. Um, it, I think Fox and MSNBC, if we, can, if we can say those are sort of opposite ends of that media spectrum of, of one kind, um, you know, they're very open about where they're coming from. If, if I have any challenge to Fox on a personal level, it's the technique. You know, I would prefer the civil discussion from a particular point of view rather than, uh, there was a commentator recently talking about some college, or high school kids in Colorado who've walked out of class to protest changes in their AP history class. And, and I think she called them uh, thugs. And I thought, you know, you don't have to do that. You can say that's stupid to walk out of class in the defense of education. I, I can get that point. Uh, but why call them that? You know, and so it's a tonality rather for me than the idea of having a, a point of view. Uh, and I do think that, you know, the greater opportunities exist uh, 
across the spectrum to have the kinds of discussions. It's interesting, religion breaks out in media, sometimes by accident. Um, Friday night on the Bill Maher show, um, uh, Ben Affleck began to talk about and criticize Maher and his guests painting Islam as one sort of monolithic approach. Um, Affleck had a different view. It was actually very interesting, a real argument among celebrities, not, not reality TV staged. Uh, on The Good Wife, I think the television program is, very interesting episode, uh, just aired the other day, on the principal character who I believe is very unchurched, very, not a, much a person of faith, but uh, having a daughter who has found faith. And, and it was a show really around the plot development or whatever it was, um, of this sort of awareness of, oh, you know, that's, I, that's an interesting point. So, you know, I don't want to be Pollyannish, but I think one of the things that's happening is this recognition that the audience is demanding of media the kinds of discussions I suspect we'd all want to have. And maybe it's, maybe it's beginning to creep in, um, sometimes intentionally and sometimes by just, uh, maybe it's an economic decision. That we better start talking to people who, uh, you know, would like to watch us because the audience is splintered and there you are who don't watch television. They've got to get you back. So. Just jump in real quickly. So one thing that NPR is, um, NPR lost its main religion reporter over a year ago and they haven't replaced her. Yeah, so we've been uh, over a year now of NPR coverage without a full-time dedicated, it was Barbara Bradley Haggerty who, um, who retired, um, and we haven't had that in a, in a little over a year now uh, from NPR. So if you've noticed a little drop-off in religion coverage stories, that's why. Uh, at NPR Time magazine about five years ago, Amy Sullivan was the last full-time uh, reporter for religion at Time magazine who had been there, they'd had a full-time religion reporter since the 20s uh, at, at Time Magazine. So these are sort of two big institutions that would know. The New York Times saw, so has two, actually, uh, uh, full-time religion uh, beat record, reporters, but that's an anomaly. Um, and at Washington Post uh, has full-time religion reporters as well. Um, one other thing I'll say about the, the, the structuring, though, by television, uh, the segmentation of the public by television, it is um, asymmetrically partisan. Right, so when we look at this kind of most trusted uh, news network, 53% of Republicans say they most trust Fox News, right? On the Democratic side, there is no, uh, no network that reaches more than 31%, right? So, so Democrats are much more divided in their media uh, consumption than Republicans are. So it makes a kind of interesting asymmetrical kind of media segmentation by, by party. Um, and, and there's a lot of literature actually in political science that shows that, that uh, you know, you can't sort of make a causation argument, but there is a kind of asymmetrical polarization happening between the political parties where the Republican Party is actually moving farther away from center on a whole range of issues. So the gap between Democrats and Republicans are getting bigger, but there's more movement from the center uh, among the Republican Party than the Democratic Party uh, now, and it, it fits with this uh, media consumption. Question over. Great. Oh, we have a question. Well, Hold on, let's get you on the mic. Yeah. It, it strikes me, thank you, it strikes me that one, uh, what we're seeing today has been an operation for a very long time, and that is the reduction of access to media uh, with the removal of uh, public service programming, which allowed the public to actually go on the air or to actually present in media. That went away, and it has not really been replaced. Secondly, the reduction in religious reporters is across the board in all areas of news because there's been a reduction in news. Uh, and we have not really addressed that sufficiently. We sort of go along with it, but news is more passe than it is present and going forward. The other is I think that the language also is changing. And I, I'm fascinated by uh, the way people refer to religion. Um, we use the term in our organization, interfaith. And my staff is saying, we're no longer interfaith, we're multi-faith. Um, people who we're calling unchurch have very deep values and practices that come from a religious context. And, and then finally, the, the structure, the physical architectural structure of churches are, really seems to be offsetting. And people are finding themselves very much in a sacred place in the outdoors, uh, at the Starbucks, and in places that don't look like traditional religious sanctuaries. So I'd love for you to respond to some of that. 
And I would just say we are getting close to the end of our time, and, and uh, Reverend Cripps has really given you a, a full question, so I think maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll use that great question as our closing set of comments for this, well, this conversation. I, I Art, I, um, I don't necessarily agree in the diminishment of news coverage. I just think we're in an evolution of news coverage. And certainly around the way that religion is, is being covered, it's not covered in the same ways that it once was by, by traditional media. I'll also add uh, another change that has been significant is that reporting among religious institutions themselves has changed. 10 years ago when I was working as an editor and publisher, for United Church News, I was a part of an editor's circle uh, representing broad interfaith groups of publications and news services which were operating almost entirely independent or semi-independent of their organizations and reporting daily, providing weekly or news, uh, monthly newspapers or magazines, and you know this, that uh, many, many of those publications either no longer exist or they exist as house organs of, their, of the denominations or faith groups themselves. So even within a tradition, that sort of depth of reporting is not necessarily coming out the way it, it once did. But at the same time, thanks to new media, we have this rise, this pop-up of self-appointed and very effective people who've said in the absence of that critique of my religious tradition, I'm gonna provide my own blog or whatever that's gonna do that. And I think that's one of the places, for example, where Huffington Post has kind of filled this niche in, in, in a lot of different areas around LGBT or minority rights or even religious reporting. Um, that I, I think they're, we're really seeing an up and coming ways in which religion is getting attention um, in, in new media as, as it has been diminished in traditional media. Um, I'll say a couple of things about um, your uh, reference to people finding sort of the sacred outdoors and this interfaith uh, comment. Uh, I think I'll close with that. But, um, you know, yeah, we're in a vocabulary challenge right now. So what do we do with this kind of, is it interfaith? And faith is sort of a Christian-y term. Uh, is it interreligious? Is it multi-religious? Like what's, and I think there's a, just a struggle uh, for uh, the, a, the, the Associated Press, Rachel Zolt, the Associated Press, actually just wrote a chapter in the AP Style Guide for the first time on religion. Uh, to try to give religion reporters, and, and because there aren't that many religion reporters, some guidance about how to talk about different uh, religious groups and these kinds of terms uh, that's there. So we are just, that's a real struggle. Um, the other thing to say is that um, you know, we are still, you know, uh, even so, you know, I'm in kind of the sociology, political, political science world, trying to wrap our heads around uh, the real diversity here, um, and we're just beginning to put the tools in the hands of reporters to do that well. So we just launched this thing called the American Values Atlas, which is a uh, kind of interactive map that reporters can go to, and if they're reporting in North Carolina, they can immediately get the religious demographics of North Carolina or Columbus, Ohio, to kind of get their heads into the story uh, there. Um, but one other point on the unaffiliated uh, folks, we have found that about a quarter of the unaffiliated, uh, well, about half of them actually grew up religious and have, and have left, so they have a kind of religious background, and about a quarter of them actually still consider themselves religious people even though they don't claim a religious affiliation. Uh, and that's a pretty interesting phenomenon and one that I think we're still trying to, fig trying to figure out as we go. Do they have multiple religious affiliations? Some of them do. So interestingly enough, about 13% of the public, if you ask them, do you, follow the faiths in, or do you follow the beliefs and practices of more than one religion, more than one in 10 Americans say yes uh, to that question. And about a quarter of the country is married to someone of a different religious tradition than their own, uh, also a new reality. You know, I think you, you touch on something that's a reminder to me that um, I keep having to say to myself, the web is really only about 20 years old, uh, that we don't know where we're going with this new tool, that many of the changes we're seeing, uh, I don't know if you can carry the analogy too far, but you know, trying to figure out a teenager, if you've had a teenage son or daughter, um, you know, I look at the web and I think, that's what I'm trying to do with this thing. I'm trying to see what this sort of newly mature or maturing entity is. You know, it's moved from toy to tool to necessity as a, as a presence in our lives. And we're just really finding all the possibilities. We're, as institutions, I think both um, organized faiths, traditional faiths, new faiths, and journalists, if you will, if you don't mind me lumping all of them together, um, are really trying to say, what do we do with this new thing? How do we address this new ability? 
you know, how do I respond to a news community that, that may want coverage of celebrities and some other fluff items and will never make that phone call to me to say, what's the latest story on AIDS in our community? But I know I have to provide that. You know, and how do I respond to this new demand culture rather than the place where I decided it was a story? So I think one of the, the suggestions I would have for um, traditional religions, if you will, and, and really new religious communities is to say, don't stop or turn away from the media source that you don't think is doing a good job. They need to hear from you in this new world. They need to hear maybe even more than ever the kinds of stories, the kinds of opportunities. I think it's a great opportunity for those of us who are, uh, as I am now on the receiving end, to really have more influence than ever because that editor that could rely on those decisions that he watched another editor make, who watched another editor make before them, uh, that, that tradition, that history, and those judgments, the validity is gone. So I would hope that we enter into this new era hopeful and see media opportunities for not a challenge, but really this, again, the opportunity to increase coverage of these things that are so essential to our everyday life. That's great. I mean, we, um, the UCC's Media Justice Ministry, we just finished last month the Media Violence Fast, and one of the reflections we sent out talked about in this new interactive web world, speaking of the web maturing now, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, the information coming to you, it's, it's extremely interactive. And one of the concepts we, we talked about was that clicking is a public act these days. So when you click on something, people know, the people who are creating that content and figuring out what kind of content they, they know what you've clicked on. So you've clicked on something they weren't really sure about, they know that you clicked on it so that you could give an incentive to a certain kind of t content to uh, be covered and to covered more because you're just clicking on it. So clicking on it used to feel private, but now clicking is actually becoming more public. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. I really appreciate all your time uh, to come out this morning, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation next. So, but thank you to uh, Jean Polatinsky with the Museum Institute, and Dr. Robert Jones with the Public Religion Research Institute, and Dr. Reverend Be Bennett Getz with the United Church of Christ Local Church Ministries. And we are going to turn over very quickly because in addition to religion and media, obviously we have this tiny issue of race and media, and uh, Jean and uh, Richard Prince are going to have a very interesting conversation about that forthwith. So thank you so much.